That's my Twitter ID. My email is shoya.sarkar.gmail.com. If you have any questions following this talk, you can email me. If you have any questions while I'm speaking, you can just put up your hand and uh, I'd rather have an interactive discussion than a, than a monologue. A few things, uh, I work at GE, but uh, it's not a sales pitch. We'll try to keep it as vendor neutral as possible and uh, very non corporate ish. Um, so, you know, ever since the dawn of humanity, people have been trying to see what is inside the human body. This is a picture of a gentleman called Rene Lenek in France, it's 1820, and uh, he's trying to hear what's inside the chest of a person and detect tuberculosis. On his left arm, if you see, thank you. So in his left arm, you see that small little thing, which is the first stethoscope. This person invented the stethoscope. And I just noticed today morning, I don't know whether this is a coincidence, that one of the elephants over here have something like that. I don't know whether that's a stethoscope or not. But that was 1820, and in 200 years we we've come quite a bit, you know. Uh, and this is what we have now: a digital stethoscope. So, primarily, all the data that we gather from inside the human body today is digital. That's that is the takeaway. And in this discussion, we shall talk about such kind of digital data that we can gather from the human body. The size of those data and what are the challenges uh, in uh, handling and managing that kind of data at that scale. So I understand that a lot of people in this uh, session are not from a medical imaging background. So I'll, I'll just take a few minutes to give you an overview of uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about. It's a very basic uh, super crash course in medical imaging. So in medical imaging, we have this term called modalities. Modalities are nothing but ways by which you can gather data from inside the human body and see that data in a visually, humanly interpretable form. So this is what we call a digital x-ray. It's uh, something very similar to a normal analog x-ray which many of us have uh, had experiences with. You have a generator and an x-ray uh, a machine which kind of shoots x-ray onto the human patient who's lying down on the table and you have a detector which which slits underneath this and it's kind of like the CCD detector that you have on your digital uh, camera and it just captures an image which looks like that that's that's uh, that's what we call a side cut or a sagittal cut of the human spine you can see a little bit of skull and the mandible over there now this is one of the simplest forms of data gathering. This works on basic physics principles. You shoot x-ray, some of the x-ray is absorbed by the tissues, some of it is absorbed by the bones, some of it passes through. Okay. And this, what we need to remember, this is 2D. So you kind of see a 2D plane of what's inside the human body. Very good for finding out fractures, uh, tuberculosis, that kind of stuff. This is another imaging modality called computed tomography or CT. This works on a very similar principle to that of an X-ray, but the difference is that this is in 3D. So what happens is there is a rotating X-ray which kind of goes around your body when you are lying on the table. And it gives you a shot from different angles which you can all compose together and build up a 3D volume. And that's that's a that's kind of what a 3D volume looks like with color maps and textures put on it. And then we have magnetic resonance imaging. Okay, uh, what this does is it uses the properties of magnetic spin inside the human body. We have a lot of water molecules, and this uses the property of magnetic spin in these water molecules. And this is good for imaging tissues inside the body. It's not really very good for uh, bones, but uh, if you look over there, this actually this is a picture of a ligament in your knee, which is not your knee. Uh, it's somebody's knee which is getting compressed by these two bones. 
And then we have another modality called the PET. Uh, it stands for positron emission topography. This is very interesting. This does not really show you the structures in the human body per se. But what we do is we inject a radioactive biomarker inside the human body. And the biomarker has the property of latching on to cancer cells. Now when it latches on to cancer cells, it starts emitting, uh, it, it undergoes a positron decay and starts throwing out photon particles. And then you then have this, you have a whole ring inside this which catches and counts these photon particles coming out of your body and understands that this is where the, cam the, the cancerous tissues are. And then we superimpose that on a CT image, which is very good at kind of you know, showing the structures, the bones in the human body, and find out exactly where the problem is. So essentially the red areas that you see, or the dark areas that you see over here, these are known as hot spots. So you can kind of find out if there is a occurrence of cancer, or very importantly, a relapse of cancer in the human body. Many a times we see a patient uh, comes in for cancer treatment, goes back home, completely cured, you know, the cancer was probably somewhere in the shoulder, and uh, 18 months later, finds out that there's a relapse of a different kind of cancer in the ankle, in a completely unrelated body part. So PET scans are good, you scan the whole human body, uh, 100 1.2, 1.3 meters of the human body, and you can find out if there are any cancerous cells anywhere that are malignant and growing. So, the basic fundamental of imaging is this. This is what we call the basic imaging. You have the human body, and you have what's called a digital acquisition system or an electromechanical software system which picks up signals from the human body. It can be a change of uh, magnetic spin which is conveyed by a RF frequency. It can be uh, you know, simple x-rays passing through the human body. It can be these photon counts which the digital acquisition system picks up. But essentially what we are trying to do is there is a change in the physics inside the human body and we are using some kind of a quote unquote camera to catch that and uh, get some information. Now, the information that's captured by this digital acquisition system is nothing that a human eye can understand or a human brain can understand. You know, for example, photon comes coming from the human body. We will not be able to understand that. So we have something is done to these signals, but and these signals are most mostly they're not even in the visual XY or XYZ plane. They're not in a three-dimensional visual axis. So we construct an image from these signals, and that's a whole different uh, volume. We're not going to do that, but essentially what I want to convey is we have some signals coming in from the human body. We construct images out of them, and then we add patient information. Obviously, when we are doing medical imaging, it does not make sense if there is no patient context. So we gather the patient context from either the database or the guy who's doing the scan types in the name of the patient, the age and weight. We add the patient context, and then comes on a viewer, which finally humans are able to understand, they're able to look inside the human body and diagnose the problems. So the crux of this slide is the fancier your digital acquisition system is, the larger your data set. It's, it's kind of this similar principle as the number of millions of pixels that you have on, on your digital camera. The more the number of pixels, pixels, the bigger your raw file size is going to be. So let, let's get into how big is that image data really. This image data is, is broken up into two parts. One is the header information, which primarily has a bunch of information about uh, the, the patient, what, who has referred the patient, what kind of a scan is it, uh, what's the age of the patient, uh, but primarily text data. And then we have pixels of information, which is actually an image that you can see visually on the computer screen. The, the text data hovers around a few things. And the pixel data, assume that it's a 1024 by 1024 image space, and uh, these are mostly grayscale images, mostly. You have 16 bits per pixel, it works out to about two megabytes. 
So two megabytes of data. But that's not too much, right? Two megabytes is not, not really huge data. And why do we have a problem? The problem is that these data sets don't come along. You have a series of data sets that's acquired when you are doing a medical image scan. And each of these is around two megabytes, depending on the kind of scanner, the kind of modality. We're just talking orders of magnitude. So when you put a human on a table and you're scanning that person, you got a picture of these slices of bread. And that is exactly how it looks like when the image is coming. It's as if you're cutting the person, you're creating slices of that person and looking into the person this way. This is the nature of most of the data that we got. So these data come in, comes in volumes, or we call, we have different uh, medical terms for slices, some call it C's, but uh, essentially there's a large amount of medical data which comes in. And okay. not only this, when you do a scan, we have multiple kinds of scan. I mean, if you want to do a CT scan, it's not just one set of data. A CT scan will have four or five different sets of data based on the parameters which the doctor wants to apply on the data. So kind of multiplies very, very quickly. These are what we call slices, individual slices. The kind of, this is a pictorial representation. So you kind of, you know, if you cut off the head and you are looking from the top, this is what, what it would uh, look like. So this is your gray matter. And so how big are these data sets? So if you uh, will take a, example of a CD cardiac scan. If you look at a CD cardiac scan, you can have 3,000 images per set. And each of these data, so the size of one data set is about 6 GB. And for one exam, one person goes to the hospital one day, takes one exam, it can multiply up to 36 GB. So this is the size of the data that we're talking for one person. So then the question comes, how do you take it home? How many of you have seen an X-ray film? Some of you have. This is what it looks like. Okay. Um, you go to the doctor, the doctor gives you this X-ray film after taking the X-ray or if it's a CT scan, he is going to put in He's going to compose a film like this, which looks pretty much like this, but he's going to put a small number of images, not, not, you've got two images over here. He's going to put, you know, like 10 by 15 stacks of images and give it to you. The problem is, this is not digital. Okay. You have to take it, you have to carry it home, you have to preserve it, and there's no way to keep this film safe for a long period of time. 10 years, 15 years, you cannot. Then obviously with, with advent of technology, what we have are uh, what we call interchange media. It can be CDs, can be uh, DVDs. So the doctor will burn all your digital data onto a CD or a DVD and give it to you. So you could uh, take it to another physician and you can show it if that physician accepts the DVD. We have some format and protocol problems which we'll get into later. But the bigger question is a medical legal question. Who is responsible for preserving this data? What happens if they, this data gets lost? Today in India, the laws are not that strong, so we do not have good governance of over medical data. In uh, other parts of the world, particularly in Europe and US, the governance of medical data is strong, very strong, and it's getting stronger by the way. You, you'll get into that in a while. So fundamentally, if you want to store data and if you want to share that data, we need a format and a protocol. Think about uh, JPEG files. If you want to send me JPEG files, you, you have to first have to have a format definition that your computer and my computer can understand. And then you have to have a protocol. It can be an HTTP based protocol, you can have an FTP based protocol, but there needs to be a certain protocol. The fun part about medical imaging is that up until 1993, there was no standard protocol in medical imaging. And that's a that's a picture of the Tower of Babel. It's a, it's a biblical story which kind of goes on to say what happens if you don't have a standard way of communication. It's funny that 
the X-ray was invented in the early part of the last century, around 1920s. And for around 70 years, there was no format for capturing, storing, and sharing medical images. That changed. Around 1993, we started, we started to uh, work on a standard. Not me, I think. But uh, generally, the community started working on a standard, and we've got a standard called DICOM. It stands for Digital Information and Communication in Medicine. So DICOM, and DICOM deals with primarily the kind of images I've shown you. The CDs, the MRs, the uh, nuclear med cameras, ultrasound, uh, x-ray, and now it's getting into the field of pathology. So if you have a digital microscope and you capture some data, you want to store that data, you want to share that data, we have this uh, standard called DICOM. It's, it's a pretty complex standard. It's, it's huge. Actually, it's huge. It's kind of like what I see, like the Indian Constitution. So there is a standard, but there is no standard way of interpreting that standard. Because when you have, uh, you know, every year there are 12 or 13 supplements to the standard coming out. So what your interpretation of the protocol is, or the, or the data format is, may not be the same as my interpretation. And we get into a lot of problems with that while sharing images. So one thing which we need to know is that DICOM is based on TCP IP. And this is very important because we are going to take a look at some of the problems that uh, this offers. Uh, uh, so this is kind of based on the TCP IP protocol. Uh, when it started, and this is a historic site, when it started, it was not even based on TCP IP because TCP IP itself was forming. So they had a, a physical 50 pin connector that you would run between two machines and use a, basically a data link kind of a protocol to, um, to go to transfer data from one machine to the other machine. So we'll, we'll get into a mind exercise on how much data do we really need to store these images. And what we're going to try to answer is how much disk space is needed if I'm going to do a cardiac screening of everyone in Bangalore. I want to do a cardiac, a CT cardiac scan to rule out the possibility of calcification in the human heart for everyone in Bangalore. How much data space do we need? This kind of thing is, is not exactly a mind exercise. There are communities, there are governments which are actually trying to do this for the health population. I mean, we don't have in uh, Bangalore yet. So once we settle the CM Rao, we will we'll look at that. But this is a very important question. How much data do you need? And that is the crux of the challenges and problems. Now, one thing what I want to say is that these are back of the angle of calculations. So worry about the magnitude of the scale, not the exact numbers. Because depending on what kind of a digital acquisition system you have, your size of the data could go up or could go down. But the order of magnitude remains same. So this is uh, the proposed route map for the Bangalore Metro. Um, and this is the heart, this is the human heart. So assume that we have a population of 7 million people in Bangalore. You've got to take a few, you know, 1 million. And everybody is not going to be able to do a cardiac scan, and we do not need to do a CD cardiac scan for everybody in Bangalore. So let's take a cut of percentage, just 50%. Roughly people over the age of 35 or nearly 40 uh, would want to do a scan and we can delay whether it is 50% or 23% or 47% doesn't change the numbers. So the hardest space that's required to store a CT cardiac scan is around 20 gigabytes. That is for one person. So the space that we need is 70 petabytes for just the city of Bangalore. If we were to do a population health exercise, we would need 70 petabytes of data for the population of Bangalore. So how does it look in scale when we put it into perspective? 20 terabytes of data, that's the Library of Congress. Okay. Um, AT&T call records, 312 terabytes of data. This is the largest single database in the world as of today. It's got a few trillion rows of data. Google Earth, and uh, this is just, just the land part. We're not so much interested in the water part. The emerged land database for Google is close to 450 terabytes of data. And this is the Google crawler. This, this data is actually a few years old, so this could have changed, gone up by a 
900 terabyte or so. 850 to 900 terabytes is the size of the Google index, not, not the index, including all the documents. Then put 70 terabytes, 70 petabytes, it's, it's kind of, you know, if you would put that 70,000 terabytes, it's, it's going to go through the ceiling. So that's the data space we need to do proper population health management, which we don't have. So we don't do proper population health management. So just to get you involved in some of these numbers, we actually have Christian Medical College in Velour who are keeping track of all the scans that they do. They've been keeping track for the last 10 years and their database size is around 60 terabytes. We have a healthcare, it's, it's a group of 14 hospitals in Israel whose database size is growing at 20 terabytes annually, oh, sorry, 250 terabytes annually. Velour has half a million of exams per year. This entire hospital chain has 4.5 million of exams every year. The estimated imaging data size just in the United States in 2014 is around 100 petabytes and estimated imaging size in 2020 is 35 petabytes which, which is like 10 to the power 6 petabytes so it's a lot lot of lot of space so fundamentally there are three challenges that we have in uh, in medical imaging one is archival how do we store the data one is search now that we have stored the data how do I retrieve that data from that huge database? If you go in for the, a doctor's consultation and the doctor wants to bring back your five years of medical history, including images, it needs to be done in a finite amount of time. You cannot, you cannot, you would not like to wait for like five hours for the images to come back. And the third is transfer. These huge images, this, this is one of the principal problems. How do we move these huge images from one place to the other place? And before this slide, so take this example. You write a blog post and you put it up on WordPress. It's a very important blog post. You don't have a local copy. You put it up on WordPress and three days later you find that the WordPress server has crashed, the database has gone conked off, and your blog post is not retrievable. What is going to be your reaction? You're going to be mad. But more than being mad, is there anything that I can do as an individual user? Right? I can write another blog post on blog spots and how bad WordPress is. But there's not much we can do. This is not the same with many images. Governments around the world regulate that anybody who's storing medical images provide a guarantee like the hospitals or the clinics that are storing medical images, they provide a guarantee that these medical images are going to be preserved for a really long time. Let's, let's take a, this is some uh, data from the National Health Services in the UK. The British government rules that for mothers, you have to store data about the mom and the child for at least 25 years. So if, if, if you, know, you, you know anybody who's a pregnant mother, she has an ultrasound scan, that data needs to be stored for 25 years. If, if somebody is suffering from Alzheimer's, you need to store that data for at least eight years, even after the patient has died. For children, when a child is born, a child is born with a, you know, a condition like a congenital heart or neonatal jaundice, you make some scans, you got to store until that child is 25. So, this concept of providing guarantee, how do you do that? The good news is that the DICOM standard builds in a protocol called storage commitment, where there is a protocol by which when you send an image from one of these modalities or a CT scanner to the hospital image server, there's a protocol which guarantees that the image is going to, has been stored over there properly and you can delete the image from your local data store. Okay. Again, huge capacity requirements. Uh, you know, this one is particularly interesting. Space and data center grade infrastructure. Um, 
storing 60 terabytes of data, which CMC Valor is doing today, is not possible for every other clinic and hospital in India. And you are not going to get that kind of a storage guarantee or that set of hardware through which you can say, I'm going to be able to store this data for a long time. It costs a lot. It just costs an awful lot of money. And that, that's why these, uh, these systems which guarantee storage service are, are extremely costly. The second problem is actually finding the data. Once you've stored this data, how do you find the data? And it turns out that search is actually a software problem. It's, it's not a very complicated problem. The reason is we are at this point, we are not so much interested in the pixel data. The pixel data is so huge, we don't really know what to do with it. Even if we had a way of traversing through it, you know, uh, we don't know what to do with it. So what we do is we index only the metadata or the header information of patients. And the, the other part is that this standard for DICOM because of the time it was built, it's a very structured schema-based standard and loves SQL. Okay. You can even see concepts from SQL which has been taken into the standard. So all you need to do is store your header information into SQL tables. And uh, the pixel information is stored in flat files. Now this is a pattern. This is something that we at G Healthcare do uh, across a large number of our product lines and we've over the years, we found it to be very useful in our situation. Uh, does not mean that this is a standard way of doing it. There are uh, uh, organizations which will insert this pixel data into a blob object, into this SQL table, which kills performance. But this is something that we, uh, that, that we do. The good thing is that you get the power of SQL queries when you are looking into your database. I want to look at uh, Shorya Sarkar's CT scans from 1st January 2000 to 31st December 2005. It's a very simple query. The database is huge, but you know that's that's what databases are meant for. They give you the power to find that data very quickly. Insertion is fast, and reading is also fast because we use memory map IO because the pixel data is being put into flat files. So you can really read and write very quickly from the disk. Uh, we use something called table replication because it's very common for a database to crash while a system is in operation. So while a database is in operation. So yesterday, yesterday I happened to go to CMC Velo and they were saying that even with their power backup, they see a lot of power cuts, which means that their database just goes boom. Okay. Even with the UPS, uh, it barely serves the purpose. So we do see a lot of uh, database crashes, but we replicate the, just the tables, not the flat files. And the, the best part of it is that since we stored the complete file as a flat file, it is possible to recreate the header data from your flat file. So the next question is transferring these data. The fundamental question is why would I want to transfer the data? Turns out that there are three reasons, and I'll, I'll kind of skip between the next slide and this one. So this is what happens in a hospital really. You've got these modalities, a CT scanner, an X-ray system, an MRI scanner, which are continuously picking in images. Patients are coming in, coming out. Just a hospital like Velour does 1,000 fights. Dicom uh, does not tell you anything about what is acceptable or what is not acceptable. But di what Dicom does is it gives you the standard for using JPEG, JPEG 2000 as compression engines for these images. And uh, what kind of a quality factor you build, in, build into those JPEGs is a choice that you have to make. And you have to clinically validate your product before selling it in certain parts of the world. For example, if you were to make a, a, a viewer which has like a QF of 30, and you have to prove that 30 is valid for human imaging in, let's say, USA. So there's a there's a clinical validation which needs to happen. Good question. And uh, what about uh, you know uh, noise, handling noise in the data? So for example, you have taken an image and you are sharing it with uh, others. So is there some kind of signature mechanism uh, taken at, uh, at the beginning that makes sure that uh, data is still in, intact while it has been? 
Are you talking about checksums or are you talking about noise? Yeah, something of uh, other kind of uh, checksums actually. Uh, so while transferring data, it's uh, really highly likely that uh, if the data gets corrupt and the person seen on the other side would still be, could still be able to see some images, but how can we be sure that it has uh, uh, less than one? <laughs> great, great question. Dicom provides you a basic checksum feature. It's not, uh, it's not a very advanced checksum feature. So you can, more than checksums, you can have a threat of uh, somebody entering into the system and actually manipulating your data. But since these data sets are complex and there's, there's not a lot to be gained, this is not financial transaction data, we don't see that kind of attacks on our diagnostic. So I, I didn't mean attacks, rather, you know, uh, Yeah, so Dicom provides you a basic checksum correction, but it does, it's, it's not like an MD5 that is uh, guaranteed. 